in Flint, Michigan, we looked like we were on our way to a writing festival. You know, we had like denim vests with patches all over them. But at the same time, we were all pretty nerdy. Like we weren't really into like heavy duty drugs or anything like that. We smoked pot and drank and stuff, but we weren't like, we weren't too crazy. We did acid once in a while. So it was kind of like we were just as nerdy as kids that were into Star Wars, but we were into metal. Matt came over one day and he was like, cool, man. And I'm like, yeah, buy a guitar, dude. We'll start a band. And he bought a guitar. And like, within like a month, he was one of those people that just took to it like a moth to a flame. We found a copy of his fanzine called uh, Sledgehammer Press. We recorded our stuff and sent it out. And that was the first time we ever recorded anything where we, it was, we didn't have a studio, but we did like do several takes and edited together three really good basement recordings. That was the first lineup of the band, pretty much. That was where we started calling it Genocide. I got this book for, for Christmas when I was a kid. There was a little bit in here about Roman Polanski's repulsion in this photo. Uh, I found it to be really haunting. We started getting letters from other bands that were called Genocide. And, you know, obviously the name Genocide is a horrible name. I was like, cool, this is a good opportunity. We have to change the name. When I actually heard Repulsion for the first time, it blew my mind, because I was like, oh my god, it's okay for me to play like this. Like, I thought it was the weirdest thing, like nobody would like it or whatever. Like, not only is this okay, it's like everybody's influence. Repulsion are the, the, the first guys to do it. Like, they, they invented the sound. We went to a hardcore show and saw what it was all about and like, found the promoter. They were really cool and they just took a chance on us. Uh, until we started playing really fast and then I think people just didn't know what to make of it. It didn't matter whether they were punk or metal. When we like locked onto the repulsion formula, there were very few people that actually liked our music. So what happened was Matt and I went to Florida in early 85. Chuck was amazing, uh, but it just wasn't working out. What do we do now? We, we need to get a band going. There was an article in the paper about a group of friends who had been busted for um, grave robbing. And one of them was uh, a guy named Dave Hollingshead, who uh, was also a drummer. We, we got him to start playing like speed metal sort of beats, like Slayer, 
but he had never done it before. So when you're playing like double time on the hi-hats, he couldn't really do that, at least not fast enough to really, you know, blow somebody's head off. So we just kind of said, all right, just cheat. We used to call it the cheat beat. Hit the hi-hat every other time. As fast as possible. Your basic default blast beat, one foot, not two feet, one kick drum, snare, and it's all in sync. It's not all sloppy and shit, like it's just like constant. That's the single most important fundamental, I think. It's the rudiment that changed everything. The blast beat. Oh, there's so many. There's the traditional blast. The alternating. You know, there's no cheating. Yes, I referred to it when I was a kid. Over time, he got so good at the cheat beat that it went from, you know, being like the speed of like a slaughter to this machine gun sound what you hear on the Repulsion album. We were planning on releasing it as an album, but uh, we were very disappointed in the way the recording turned out. The Repulsion, the recordings from 86, uh, they were only uh, released on uh, CD. 89, 90 uh, by Necrosis Records because nobody wanted to release a demo of Repulsion because it was too noisy. The grizzle and the bass, that's grind. The grinding bass sound, you know, came from like Scott Carlson. When they went to go mix it, they realized that they wiped his actual bass track, so they just ended up using the scratch track, you know, and, and it, all, all great things come as complete accidents. That's a brilliant uh, recording. Uh. It was an unfinished album is what it, what it was, and I just started circulating it and selling it on tape because, well, I think we're gonna have to try this one more time. <laughs> Flint, Michigan is, is definitely part of our sound. My dad worked in the auto factory. Matt's dad worked in the auto factory. Aaron's dad drove a truck that delivered automobiles made in the automobile factory to dealerships all over the Midwest. That's your future. Like, you're going to be working in an auto factory. Unbelievably working class, like real gutter level working class. It literally was just tower blocks on the horizon and smokestacks and factories and the smell of chemicals. It was hard to contextualize because the, the, you lived it, you lived in that, you went to school in that, you and you, and you faced hostility, you know, on a daily basis. Initially, I was, I was brought up in a, a house that was literally a, co a commune, which was basically full of heroin addicts, which my father was one. As a seven-year-old, I was exposed then to like, the Sex Pistols, the Damned, Clash, the Stranglers, and I pretty much discovered industrial music purely accidentally. This is where I met uh, Nick Bullen. And this basically led me towards joining Napalm Death. Famously, I booked Napalm Death on a show, their second ever show. It was 1983, we're going way back, at a boat club in Nottingham next to the river here. They were 14 years old, just blowing minds, really. They played to like 60 people, if that, but it was... Uh, you knew something was pretty special. Well, I did anyway. Having something that was more reminiscent of Killing Joke or very early Amoebics, even early Swans, we wanted to put all this into a melting pot and speed it up, you know. We couldn't actually do it with the original drummer, who ironically was one of the founding members of Napalm Death, a guy called Rat. 
or Miles Rattledge, as he was known there. <laughs> Unfortunately for, for Miles Rat, uh, me and Nick were starting to talk about that he couldn't play fast enough. And this is when we happened upon Mick Harris, you know. Mick Harris was fucking wild. He was a force of nature. It was not, not human. <laughs> Mick Harris, I think, come up to me at a Napalm Death gig. And I was really enamored with his energy. It's funny that we arrived at eventually becoming gravitating to blast beats, you know, because for a minute there, we could have been actually playing very tribal sounding, post-punk. I suppose it was a revelation was when we first heard Siege. It blows my mind that bands like Napalm Death um, and, and Drop Dead, uh, who you know got their name from Drop Dead, uh, it, the bands that good, you know, uh, call us an influence. It's a, it's very much an honor for that. A lot of bands achieve their speed through what drummers will call a cheap beat. They'll simplify the beat to make the music faster, but Rob never did that. Rob played the full British discharge beat only at a much higher tempo. He was just a really raging drummer. Discharge would have been the biggest influence on Siege and on a lot of us at that period of time. Just as Discharge hated Thatcher's England, Siege hated Reagan's America. I mean, a lot of the story of the grindcore thing really does come out of the hardcore punk scene in the UK. The grind scene, I find it more political than the metal scene generally. Um, I think that comes from the punk roots probably, and like all the DIY aspect, bands are closer to, you know, the, the punk spirit and the punk vision. Punk has always been political music. I'm not saying there isn't political people in metal, but it was always more about music with metal, whereas punk was always more about the politics. Well, hardcore punk, a lot of people had a lot of things to say, you know, I want to be different, and I want to rebel, and all these other people are lame. And the metal guys, they're like, I want to master my instrument and play it better than anyone. The A-side was recorded, I think, for a potential release as a split album. That was the thing back then. Justin basically gave me the tapes and said, well, sold them to me. I'm like, right, but now I need the B-side. Justin became a little bit disillusioned, but he was friends with a band called Head of David. He left, and they were their guitarist. And Nick Bullen actually asked me to play guitar. This is between A-side and B-side on Scum. And I said, yes, I'll do it. And I went back with them, but I kind of chickened out. And I don't know, I just lost my nerve. And so they were there, the band went through a weird period for a few months where they weren't really doing much. So Mick Harris was kind of left on his own, and he recruited Lee Dorian, Bill Steer. As Mick got a new lineup together, the idea was, let's do another recording and have an A and B side. So that's kind of the way it turned out. I mean, it's two different bands, Mick Harris being the only constant, a bit crazier. I mean, they never rehearsed, they never planned anything. It's hard to explain how uh, unprofessional it was, <laughs> looking back on it. <laughs> it was just a very fun outlet initially, but I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. I mean, even being in a band was a bit of a fantasy, really. John Peel um, in the UK is a very famous name because um, that's a DJ whose career spans decades. So you're going back to, you know, the Beatles era. I guess as the years went by, he managed to attach himself more and more to the extreme fringes of music. I was exposed to so much music thanks to John Peel, you know. I was a 10-year-old kid with a tiny little radio, a wireless radio, battery-operated radio, listening in bed when I should have been going to school. So you can imagine the first time I heard John Peel play anything off scum. 
I'd left the band by the time he first played Scum. That very night, he played Head of David, and straight after he played a track off Scum, the side armor, and it was like, oh my God. You know what I mean? This is, this is who, who I grew up listening to is now just played. Not only a John Peel session of a band I've just joined, but now Scum. And now Palm Death just fucking blew up after that. from Napalm was so rapid because of what he did for the band. Well, it's a very brave thing. I mean, you know, even nowadays when something's confrontational, people, can't, people find it hard to digest, you know, but back then I think it was even harder. It was, it was just hard to take in. You know, you're just a kid and your music's being played on national radio. Well, Mickey came up with the term. It didn't come from the press, as many people think, or even the underground press, it was Mickey. Um, a lot of alternative indie magazines were then focusing on grindcore. To them, it was a completely new thing. Even though, to me, Napalm Death was always a really fast, hardcore metal band, when the term grindcore came out, that was a whole different spectrum then, really. All the hardcore kids were like, man, you heard this fucking scum record? It's, it's, it's completely ridiculous. Play side two first. Play side two. Don't play side one. Side one kind of sucks. Play side two. And I'm like, really? What's it like? He's like, Oh man, it sounds like fucking Popeye screaming at people. The sound was still changing, I think, at that, at that point. It definitely changed on the second album, but I'm not saying I was, I wouldn't say I was the conscious part of it. It was just going that way, really. And so the first thing I actually <clears throat> recorded with them was actually a John Peel radio session. I hadn't even played a show with them. So we did a couple of new songs on that. It wasn't until we did the second album, really, from Enslavement, where we used the songs that I'd written. I was at a store in Houston. I'd go to Houston a lot for shows, and we'd go to these, they had really good record stores, and I found Napalm Death from Enslavement to Obliteration. And on Marker, it was written, fastest band in the world. This is the fastest album ever made, and I was like, oh man, I gotta have that. So I went out and bought it. I put it on, and the first song's really slow. I'm like, this isn't fast, man. I, this, I'm not into this at all. Then right after it just kicks, and it takes off for the entire fucking record. That second song kicked in, and he was like plucking in a Christmas tree. From Enslavement, Scum, those records are just groundbreaking. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about this if those records didn't exist. PLF from Houston, Texas. Let's fucking grind. Uh, depends. Yeah, sometimes maybe like one or two, sometimes like five or six. A week? A week. Like when I first heard like Insect Warfare when I was like maybe 15 years old, I just, I, I was like, wow, you know, that's the fucking heaviest shit I ever heard in my life. It's a very honest genre too. You just pretty much play as fast as you can, scream, scream as loud as you can, just fucking go balls out. Yeah. 
is pretty fucking extreme. I like knowledge the fact that uh, the average population doesn't even think it's music, but uh, you know, it, get, it just keeps getting more fucked up. We call it music, but for maybe like most like uh, random, like normal people, they think this is noise, especially where I'm from. For sure, like compared to like Asian pop, like like K-pop, J-pop, whatever, that's like, this is like noise. But for us, this is true music. But I, I think the thing that uh, all things grind that like, like really like dialed it all in for me was Terrorizer. Like Terrorizer, the like, one and only American grind band, like, Jesus Christ, dude. My original band was Terrorizer back in 80, 89. Back then, as kids, we didn't have much. Uh, like a couple of pedals, which we, you know, a couple of pedals and whatever we had, and uh, just try to get the best sound out of them. This one guy used to come see us practice all the time, and um, he told us he had a drummer. Well, the guy takes off ha half an hour later, he walks in with Pete. Well, back then, there was not many drummers that were doing the blast. There was just uh, speed, you know, thrash, black metal. I just wanted to take it to the next level, you know. Uh, I wanted to play like double the skank beat. He looks like he's putting out a cigarette. He does a swivel thing, and so he gets like a, like a double bounce going. When me and Jesse heard that, right there and then, we told him, well, do you want to join the band? I remember Jesse was, uh, I guess he was writing with David Vincent. David Vincent was asking Jesse that where could they find a drummer like Pete? And Jesse gave him up. Jesse said, well, you could have our drummer. That's when Pete told me that um, David and them sent him a ticket to go to Florida. And I mean, I got pissed because he took off on us. And then Jesse already made his move. I guess he was gonna go play with Napalm. I was already, already writing to, to Jesse um, for a couple of years before and calling up at stupid hairs of the morning because I didn't know what the time difference was between England and LA. I think originally he thought it was just for one tour and he ended up staying for, well, for many albums, you know. There was not a lot of interest in, the, in Terrorizer. And plus these other bands were, also, were, were big bands, you know, Morbid Angels. They had like a, a beginning of a history. You know what I mean? So it was something cool, nice for me to join bands like that. And then with Napalm Dead, another big band. So it was what it was supposed to be, man. I don't really know what happened to Terrorizer after that, you know. Many years passed. It was just a one album by Terrorizer that was basically Na Napalm Death and Morbid Angel members. Because we were under a contract for two albums and, you know, it was a... Uh... Pete's schedule, real busy with Morbid Angel, and same thing with Jesse. I mean, we got close a couple of times, but it never happened. And, you know, I wish it would have. Um, and do, were you in communication with Pete much at this time? No, I don't talk to him at all. It's just bad things between me and him right now. Supposedly, I gave up on Terrorizer, and, you know, I didn't give a band a chance, which, obviously, he took off to Morbid, and then Jesse took off with, uh, with Napalm, and from there on, man, uh, I just don't really talk to him at all. I did a radio show at uh, the uh, University of Ottawa, a metal radio show with a friend of mine, and um, I was discovering a lot of bands that way, and the way I got into grindcore was one day he put on Brutal Truth's uh, Walking Corpse from Extreme Conditions. It's such a classic song. The way it starts with like this tear and it's like, ah! I'm gonna play this aggressive stuff too. I wanna do this. 
who am I going to get to play with me? And I thought of Scott and Brent. Brent had a permanent nickname, Gern. Gern Blanstein, one of Steve Martin's characters on Saturday Night Live. We formed as a three-piece, so I'm like, fuck this, we're getting a singer. Kevin was just obscene. He'd already gone on the Grind Crusher tour in England and everything and wrote for CMJ, College Music Journal. Me and Dan were doing something else, and then it, he, he got really tired of fucking doing vocals. I recorded something with a drum machine and had him sing over it. Some of those riffs actually turned into Denial of Existence. Back in the early days of Brutal Truth, we didn't have gear. We just borrowed everything. If we were going to play Rhode Island or something like that, instead of like getting a van or something like that, we would just all fucking hop a train. I was hanging out with people like my friend Jim Welch, who at the time was running Earache USA. And all these bands were already on Eric, and we were friends with Jim. It seemed logical that that would be a natural la label to go to. It just captured the attention of Dig that Danny Looker was in a grindcore band, and they were, they were supposed to be fast as hell. I used to write for a Maximum Rock and Roll fanzine in, in the States. I was like their UK correspondent, if you like. I dabbled with promoting. I didn't know at the time, but I'm a bit of an organizing kind of guy. Uh, you know, I, I tape traded with Dig back in the day and also had a, a publicity job at the record label. I went from being a music fan to a facilitator or whatever it's been called. That's what Eric did. We were facilitators, initiators. That's what I do. I'm like, I'm ringing bands up, get in the studio, do this. It's quite forceful sometimes to do it. <laughs> in the Eric history, when the American bands were getting signed, that a bit of um, a bit more professionalism came in. We started rehearsing a lot, writing more music, and that's when the whole speed factor came into being. It worked out good that we ended up getting somebody that had never played grindcore before, because we were able to kind of mold him a little bit. Rich was straight up punk rock. He came from that Philly punk scene. So, you know, grind was absolutely new to him. I mean, uh, it was the kind of thing where, like, I joined the band, and then uh, two or three weeks later, we, like, went somewhere to, like, write an album, and then right from that, we left for a tour, and then I played 250 or more shows a year for the next th five or six years. <laughs> I wanted to be faster. I just wanted, I didn't have an attention span. I wanted to be fast. The intensity. Yeah, that's a better word. Intensity, not speed. You know, it's supposed to be like really intense. It actually is uh, pretty much addictive, I think. You know, the, the adrenaline, you get more alive. I'm a huge adrenaline junkie. And it's just great to be part of this huge thunderous noise. Music is therapy for a lot of people. I mean, even if you don't play, you start your day driving into work at 5.30 in the morning, you hate your boss, you know, somebody ran over your cat or your dog and you're just pissed off and you just unleash. One child every five seconds is neglected. One child every five seconds is abused. One child every five seconds chooses the eternal way. It's sort of like my art, you know? You know, I don't really play music. I don't, I'm not really a trained drummer. I just sort of enjoy grinding. I like to play grind, and I like to do grind vocals and yell and play super fast, and it's very much of a uh, emotional and physical sort of uh, outlet for me. So 
so many bands just do grindcore. So they have, they lack the passion, they lack the urgency. I mean, I still don't know the exact reason why those guys quit Napalm Death. They couldn't really see beyond playing to like 60 people. In their minds, and in everyone's mind really, it was a small scene. How could it, how could it ever get bigger? But things happened so quickly. Six months in the band back then was like a lifetime. I viewed Napalm as this thing that's just supposed to be very extreme, like a short, sharp shock. And I didn't really see it as having much longevity, um, which sounds ridiculous now, obviously, but that's kind of how I looked at it. Lee and Bill had left after a Japanese tour for various reasons. I was pretty devastated, really. But we knew Barney because Barney wasn't singing in uh, Benediction. Shane and Mickey knew what I could do. We thought Barney would be a good person to come in because he had a lot of energy. <laughs> I was kind of that token roadie who did nothing except drink and maybe lift a cabinet a few yards down the road. Napalm death at your fucking service. <laughs> this one, my friends, is about that person you know, those people you know who walk into a room, manage to hate everybody, hate everything. Napalm is a paradox as are many other bands of this ilk, we have very, very aggressive, extreme, violent sounding, which is the important part, music. But on the other side of things, the lyrics are peaceful, tolerant, humane, People say it's, it's a political band, and I, I wouldn't necessarily discount that. This song is about the indignity of being treated as a number, not a person. But at the same time, I also understand that politics can also mean nothing. It can be very tokenistic. Your sexuality is your own fucking business. Very divisive. Churches, these people, that people, fucking fucking church! The starting point is to bring people together, not force them apart. So my thing is, my, the underlying thing for me is a, is a humane, humanitarian standpoint. With happiness and fucking dignity, everybody fucking deserves it. This kind of music was always really integrated with like giving a shit about things. And I think that's kind of uh, says something about the general, you know, attitude. Nazi it was the extremity, which was the most important, but it was also the, you know, the opportunity to actually say something in your, you know, in your, with your band and your lyrics. What did we do that was so bad? It is offensive. It's stupid. It's 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 blue humor. It's it's dumb. It's childish. It's sophomoric. But we know it. She said, "I saw that shirt. That's your band. You're in a band called Anal Cunt." And she was crying, and I'm just like, I'm trying to justify it. I'm like, I got nothing. I got nothing. I broke my mother's heart. This sucks. I didn't mean to do that. Fuck. Oh, well. Shit. There I am with hair, like an asshole. This is my favorite. I fucking hate that cover. It's so stupid. This is the Unplugged album. Idiot Song EP, original. Mike pretty, Mike pretty much um, paid for this. Mike, Mike was the only one of us who had a job that made money. He was a, he was a press operator at like, a, at like some like 
print shop. And I think Seth pretty much convinced him, like, all right, so you can be like $200 a week and we'll get this record out. I said, okay, here. <laughs> Seth would make up bands fucking constantly. He would make up bands, death metal bands with like his cousin or his friends or something. And they'd make a demo tape and they'd say, oh yeah, this is a real band. Yeah, I have this band called Schutzgum. And Seth's like, oh yeah, well I have this band called Anal Cunt. Yeah, we're gonna play a show, man. We don't even have music, man. We just fucking like go crazy. He's like, oh yeah? He's like, yeah, you should come see us. And then he had to make the band up. Our first show ever was a rehearsal. And we played in front of his mother, his two brothers, Easter Sunday. No joke. And I remember his grandmother just looked at us and she said, you guys are going to get yourself killed if you do that. There are times when that's good, when the crowd wants it. But there are times when it's like, you know, I mean, there was one time we played, we played Texas, and he was doing the microphone thing, and he hit John square in the head, cut his head open, knocked him down, started bleeding, and he's bleeding, and he's bleeding, and he's bleeding. And I grabbed the mic from Seth, and I'm like, I need, I need a towel, I need a towel, I need something. And he cut his head open. Seth grabs the mic from me. He's like, Yeah, and I need two sprites with no ice. Somebody knocked mine over. You know, I mean, that's what you had to deal with. I never listened to my, them myself. That's not the kind of music that ever attracted me. Um, you know, I don't think everybody associates grind with anal cunt. I think there was enough other big grind bands that Anybody that knows a bit will know that it's just a subgenre of grind. No, I can respect like the noise aspect. I can get that. And then I guess they also get like a little bit of a pass because there's like, they started it, I guess. I don't think they were uh, really ever that serious of a band, but you know, they became more of a real band uh, after uh, a few years. I do not like Anal Cunt. I think Seth Putnam was a piece of shit. Everyone's like, oh, you have no sense of humor. All right, well, I don't. Fuck you. Seth Putnam is a piece of shit. The art that he created, it reflected that he was in this insensitive piece of fucking garbage that thought that everything, everyone else's pain was like one big fucking joke. He was uh, probably like you'd expect. He was a handful at times. Uh, he, was a, he was a really smart guy, though. He wasn't a complete maniac, but he definitely knew how to play his part. I had already gotten tired of, of, of the gigs and, and traveling because I was the only one that could rent a, a vehicle. And I was the only one that had a car, the only one that had a credit card. So I could see that it was, it was leaning a lot on, on me and my resources for doing it. So Tim told me he wanted to get out and I told him I wanted to get out too. Hey, that fucking cunt called us a fucking bunch of feminists. Go fucking the hell. I'm, I'm, <laughs> thanks. Fuck you all. Berkeley PhD. It got really bad. It got it got really stressful. Sometimes it would be great. You know, sometimes the crowd would be crazy and the crowd would be with it and it would be great. Or and sometimes it would be really hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's get some of these tats. This is the Grind Crusher tattoo. You know, the compilation LP from oh, yeah. Records. Uh, Jack Messerin. <laughs> <laughs> besides that, this is Agatha, please. This is the uh, really old school thing. It's like Chani. <laughs> Chani. <laughs> this is what the best. <laughs> This, this is a typical uh, kids uh, show here in Quebec, a classic show from the 70s and the, the 80s. Uh, every, every band from the crew, you know.
my first band was like Discharge. It's more like a noise project that's still going on today. We, I started that like in 1990 with a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> We're still doing this on and off uh, since uh, like the past 25 years. But uh, my first actual uh, real grind band was Think Shit. <laughs> I met Fred uh, in school and uh, we started mastering like in 1997. For a while, we were pretty much the only two bands around. We know everybody from the scene, which is from Quebec City to Montreal, even Ottawa and Toronto. It's a small scene, small world when it's grindcore. Five days, you know, starting Wednesday, finish like Sunday night, 17 hours of music. This year we had the best festival in history. We had such a great show, like SOB, Terrorize LA, you know. The people just staying since first band till last band. What's the scene like here? The scene like here, a, a brand new mix of like metal and punks that just coming together, doing a show, man. Ark Gatters, G.O.D. on the same day. We saw Jigai, we saw Psycho yesterday. There were so many great bands and you don't ex expect that kind of bands to play your, your part of the world. We like the scene. We like to give the chance, you know, to play really big stage with massive sound, even for the bands no one knows, because I think you always come to the Obscene Extreme for big names, but then you are surprised with the small one. Just getting friends together, drinking beers, and having some grindcore moments. There's no riffs. It's just like you do whatever the fuck you. you there's no real patterns. You gotta, you gotta understand why they're legendary and uh, why uh, you're not. You're playing uh, Noise Core in 2015. <laughs> you, you, you won't be as legendary as this charge we did it, in, you know, in the 80s, uh, the 90s. Sort of like a joke too, you know. It's you do it for fun, you know. You can't take that stuff serious, you know. And yeah, I think if you take noise core seriously, you're a bit fucked, you know. So, uh... Fuck you! What is happening? What is what is going on here? This is just the greatest stuff in the world. Nobody knows how to do what they're doing, and everything's great. You know what? How is this not? 
how is this like it it's reinventing music and not inventing anything sense that there's less girls in bands. To what I noticed, there's less girl listening to that kind of music. To me, I'm someone in a band, I love music, I scream. That's it. And I never overanalyzed it. I never felt, um, you know, I always felt comfortable. You know, we're all metalheads, so we, we kind of already have that attitude of like, fuck you, you can't tell me how to live my life, right? It, it comes with the territory. Like, so, I think that allows people within our community to look at me and go, awesome, she's doing her own thing. She's not letting people tell her what to do. And so then, therefore, there's like a lot of acceptance that at least I, I feel I receive. I, don't, I, I haven't felt any negative responses, even though I've seen them on the internet, right? <laughs> Taking hormones doesn't change your vocal cords. It doesn't change the size of them. Like once they're shaped, they're shaped. That's it. So you could get a surgery to change it, um, but it's wildly successful. So the way I learned to change my voice was by finding a female vocalist who was within my range that I could sing. And I would put her CD on in my car and sing along with her. When it comes to doing vocals, um, I'm kind of a strong believer that you shouldn't change the vocalist of a band if you can help it, um, because there's a lot of character in that. I wanted to do something in between Scotty, um, you know, from Repulsion, and, and Barney from Napalm Death. I got to hang out with Barney a lot, and we were talking about his, his vocal delivery and that it's really hard to mix him because he, he, his vocals are so, like, projected that they just clip everything, right? Um, and I was like, that is fucking cool. Like, I want to do that. Before this video dies, like, I just want to say Discordant Texans is, is the last great evolution of Grindcore. They took it to the next level. I don't know where it's going to go after that. It, nobody's taken it and evolved it from that yet. I was going for noisy and uh, and fast, and it was sometimes it would it was somehow it always go toward after that go towards like a melody. Um, like I, when I when I listened to a lot of music that was trying to be extreme, it was like missing the hook. You know what I mean? Something that takes you somewhere. Like I like music that takes me someplace. I don't want to just listen to it and have it wash over me. You know, I I want to experience it somehow. My thing was like, as soon as you slow down, you're selling out. It's not that melody is bad. Like, I mean, I didn't want a bass in the band because I didn't want groove and rhythm. I was so against how metal was becoming accessible. That's why I hated power violence. Because it was like three seconds of, oh, we're tough and we're playing fast and it's, it's time to start throwing down and like punching the floor and being a douchebag, hipster, fucking piece of shit. Fuck you, power violence. Fucking still get so angry about those people. <laughs> it was Lyrics were very personal, but very negative in some aspect. Yeah, a lot of people thought we were really pretentious because we didn't follow the same guideline that everyone else did. I mean, the last album was a shot from my front yard at a beach in the sky. 
I thought it was cool, though. I, I like that was the one thing I always strive to be a little different than everything else. Our first shows were actually overseas. That was where the most interest in this style of music was, was Japan. What I liked about Japan and every other band that played, it was like the, the last show they were ever gonna play in their lives. Every note and every, you know, sweat, blood, and tear, people just went for it. You can try to sound Japanese, you can't sound Japanese. It's just it's the way their equipment is, it's the way the rehearsal spaces are set up, it's the way their shows are set up. It's just a different vibe. Heresy from UK. Heresy and Concrete Sox split album. Then Napalm Death come. Oh, uh, don't forget SOB first seven inch. Ultra fast hardcore, raging hardcore. They change the sound a bit, and uh, that's why I started my own band. When Alfred Graves started back in 1993, there is no grindcore scene. How many people showed up is not uh, so important to me, you know? I can say there is more bands than 10 years ago, but uh, I think it's still underground music. So we were like just leaving the country a month out and back again, and then again, and then to Japan a month out and back again. These bands like Piss Christ, that's the old style touring where you hook up in a van and drive across Europe. Bands like Piss Christ, I think, really laid the, the groundwork for other bands from Australia to just make the contacts over there first and go, oh, look, that bloke will organise something for us, that bloke will organise something for us. And they do it, and off they go. <laughs> Australian bands going to Southeast Asia. Apparently it never happened until Warsaw did it in the 90s. And then uh, since then, heaps very popular for Australian bands to go and tour Southeast Asia. Sort of speaking off the top of my head, I haven't done an in-depth analysis of the difference between uh, national grindcore scenes. I felt it's a very international thing, actually. I felt that you don't have to understand the lyrics, you know, you don't have to, all these things have enabled it to become more international than actual national. Nazem had a hook. They'd fucking throw something in, you're like clicking with that. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. You know, if you can get that hook and you can just go, hit it, do it. France or Spain or South America, they they have some kind of humor to to it as well that 
that we just don't have. I'm Anders, I'm the founding member of Nasen. I've played every instrument in this band, uh, starting as a guitarist and a bassist, and then going on to be the drummer and singer. <laughs> so I've, uh, I've been living with this band for more than half of my life, and it's going to stay with me forever. because he's dead. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about him. For one thing, Mieszko would have hated to be a legend. People have asked me for photos of him so they can make a tattoo of his face. And I say, don't do it, because he would have hated it. He, he had a, like, this really brutal sense of humor, which would crack me up all the time. Yeah, I was, I was taking a shower. And I had this uh, indie pop record on, really loud, and it, like the, the music would get blurred out by the showers. I could only hear like the bass frequencies, and that made me think of this riff. And then he went out of the shower naked and started like playing, <laughs> doing an awesome riff off of that. I had a huge amount of respect for this guy, but he, he had this split personality where he could be the most generous, most like inviting, kind person, but he could also be like a really arrogant guy that would just be like hardcore, cold. That sucks. You suck. And I really enjoyed and feared those qualities in him. I didn't really know him. There are a lot of other people that know him much, much better and have I've seen another side of him that, that I had never saw. Our relationship was so much concentrated into, to, to Nasen. And that was fine, I guess. But it, it um, doesn't mean that I miss him every fucking week. I got a phone call from my girlfriend at the time saying, do you know anything about Mieszko? And uh, my immediate thought was that he had passed. I don't think he had like a week of that whole year. He had been working so hard that he really had to go on this vacation. And, and it's just, you know, it's just not fair. Yeshko's sister went down to Thailand to search for him. She didn't find anything. Yeshko's girlfriend was in a mess. All the bones in her body was broken and everything, so... Well, it was quite a strange time because you never expect a band member to die in a natural catastrophe. <laughs> that doesn't... I, I mean, someone can die out of the blue in a car crash or whatever, but by a fucking wave of water. Like the month and a half before his body was actually found after that, and how that was such a, it was in such an insane outpouring of, of you know, support and, and empathy. It's indescribable how, how much people cared about this grindcore singer in some band, you know? I, I try to remember him as a, as, a, as that the really lively person he was. After Mieszko died, it just became this whole sad aura around it. We felt like, okay, so the 20th anniversary would be an opportunity to actually do it like in the right way. The core of the band was all original, so to speak, NASA members. We just needed 
someone to sing the songs. Before the show, he called me up and asked if I want to do it, and I was like, yes, right away. I obviously wanted to do it without understanding how difficult, it, difficult it's going to be. I wasn't trying to mimic, I even couldn't mimic him one to one. And I was kind of throwing in some of my own things, which were feeling more natural to me. In the very beginning, we just wanted to have high energy crust grind. And we looked up to sounding a little bit like Extreme Noister and Doom, but just making it more metal and more fast and more furious, more aggressive in our way. And then having metal background just made it a little bit bigger sound. By the time the mid-90s had rolled around, Eric had diversified to the point where they were maybe losing the focus on what bands put them on the map in the first place. Not, not good communication. They were overseas, and we had problems when we were doing Need to Control, like when they lost all the artwork. They didn't pay us. Um, they, they sold, I'm sure they sold way more records than they told us they did. There was that deal that they did with Columbia, and somehow we didn't fit into their financial spreadsheet. And these bands went from nothing, literally playing pubs, to be on Columbia Records, Napalm Death, Godflesh, Carcass. It's insane, right? But that actually happened, because they were selling so many records, it attracted you know, the major label scenes. This stuff's going to break big next, you know, and it didn't, so. We felt we weren't getting any attention we deserved. And that, at the same time, Relapse had come up, and Relapse had really grown and expanded. Relapse has always been good about that. They've been on the forefront of bringing, like, a lot of extreme stuff, like, what, Misery Index, Pig Destroyer, I mean. We trust them. There's been a lot of people over the years, different people running the label, but the, their ethics have stayed the same. We don't even have a contract with Relapse, really. It's, it's just an agreement, a gentleman's agreement. Eric actually stopped signing grindcore bands later. No, maybe the last one was Brutal Truth, 92 or whatever. We had a four album deal with Brutal Truth and they, they kind of preferred working with Relapse, which was okay, but it kind of rankled me a little bit at the time. We had a label that we thought was kind of getting a tiny bit too apathetic, while well, we had another label that lived 150 miles from us, like, dude, eventually we managed to negotiate with me and Dig sitting face to face at a conference table at Earache Records in New York, and I just said, look, man, we would really appreciate it if we could just go to a label that we feel is gonna be 100% behind us right now. We were young and mouthy. And he said, fair enough, just don't talk shit about me like Jeff Walker does. And Kevin went on to. Hopefully Diggs, not, not like butt hurt over it anymore, man, but it was weird for a minute, you know? They were young guys, they were like committed to what they were doing, as I was. And uh, between us, we kind of had a good thing going. I mean, it went sour on a couple of occasions in the intervening like 25 years. Luckily, a lot of them are kind of 
water under the bridge now, old hat. So, uh, how can you guys split up? Well, now that it is about 17 years later, I mean, we did make a pact at the time that we weren't going to discuss it. Well, the original guitar player was poaching money. You know, nothing too wild or anything like that. He was tucking money away. And I think at the time, I was like, I don't really care. You know, like, but, like, you know, let's not let him handle the money anymore. Basically, we had never had a manager in the band. Different dudes in the bands were trying to take care of it. We had one guy doing all the band business. Another guy in the band said, what the fuck are you doing? Look, there's receipts crumpled up on the windshield here, you know. I'm not getting in this van to go on tour unless I take over the business. So another guy took over the business. He proceeded to kind of run things into the ground because he didn't know what he was doing either, but because he'd done this hostile takeover, he was too proud to admit it. If you ask the dude running the band, how much money we got in the bank account today? They'd just shrug at you. Um, I'm just going to say that it wasn't me or Rich. You know, Dan's really non-confrontational, and it was easier for him to dissolve the band than to uh, address the thievery. This just can't go on anymore. It's not enjoyable. I don't play music to make a million dollars. I play it because I enjoy doing it. I no longer enjoy this. Fuck this. It's over. Greek uh, texts. In one of those texts, I found uh, the name Agathocles. It, it's an uh, old Greek uh, freedom fighter. He invited the rich for a dinner, and at the dinner, uh, he killed them all. Yeah, that's, uh, and then he had a kid of his own, right? Agathocles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also a grandson. <laughs> yeah. Archagathos. <laughs> Archagathus is a descendant of Agathocles, the Greek tyrant of Syracuse. But also, our name apparently in Italian translates to where did you shit? We've been told. Archagatush. Um, translates to the old great one, I think. Old great one. So we don't really fucking know. At some point, a, a lot of uh, so-called uh, grind bands started with uh, this homophobic thing, worshipping snuff movies. Oh, yeah, you have records with dead people on. Uh, oh, can you show me? You know, and that's totally not what we mean with grind. Men's core was supposed to be just like leftist political grind core. You know, no fucking homophobia, no sexism, no racism, taking a stance on all that. and. Uh, I don't know, I've always associated it with having a really old school kind of sound too. I think of it as a, a punk rock, politically intentioned reboot of grindcore at this critical moment where things were getting to be, I think, really bogged down in a lot of metal bullshit. I think it's like just intentionally avoiding metal attitude. I think Minscore was a response to like metal guys being like, oh, grindcore, yeah, that's about like hating women and our riff, you know, bad riffs. It's about, fucking yeah, it's, it's punk, man. I don't know, it is political, but it also is a sound, I think. It's like second generation, you know, kind of Minscore. I was born around the time Agathocles was like doing some of their first records, some kind of silly father-son thing. They worship your band, you know, like this, like in terms of sound, right? Like that's... Uh, they do it uh, much better. <laughs> they, they, do it. they do it much better. Uh, 
Yeah. You know, but with like a like a strong leftist political message. Yeah, more yeah. fucking makes sense. It's not. It's not. I hear it from him a lot of times. Like, oh, now Minscore is something. The name I came up with, and now there are bands making Minscore. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's really crazy. Yeah. yeah. Like Sorry. now we have a split with a band called Haggis from from America. A new band playing Minscore. Like. Pork rind is just nasty. It's guttural. It make it sounds like they're fucking throwing up. Fucking chainsaw just ripping through people, and the vocals are all. <laughs> Carcass like really started the whole gore grind thing, I think. Like just as far as like the vocals and just the riffing style, even just down to like how the blast beats are played. Like it's just, it all goes back to Carcass. I'd started Carcass uh, or attempted to in 85 as I got to know Jeff Walker, I'm guessing towards the end of 86. We kind of rekindled the whole thing and this was the version of Carcass that you know, people later you know, came to know. Jeff had accessed some, um, they were kind of like textbooks for students, you know, students of pathology. And I think he just cut out tons and tons of stuff and then created a collage. I think there was a little bit of begrudging respect for the, the sleeve and how low we were tuned. We were using a bit of technology, God, I think it was the SPX 90 or something. Once we realized the studio had one of those, we just went nuts on it. He used like a, basically an effect pedal to pitch his voice down like at least an octave, maybe like two, to make, give it that kind of like kind of quality. It, it makes everybody sound the, like the most brutal thing on earth as long as, you know, all you gotta do is yell into it and it's makes you sound like a monster. More of a kind of a fantasy element, I think, to it than, uh, and I don't mean fantasy like swords and Conan and shit. Like, you write about the fucked up things in your head that you probably wouldn't otherwise dare speak about. There's a difference between, like, a band that, like, talks about murder, talks about death, talks about something, talks about bleak, dark, scary, fucked up shit. That's one thing. Oh, oh. Place was packed. Drop Dead just finished playing, and I missed them because I had to work. And uh, Anal Cunt's up there. Give a hand to Drop Dead for saving the world for the lyrics for the last nine years. Yeah! If it wasn't for them, the world would really be a really Republican kind of place. Seth grabs the mic. He starts walking around the stage. 
Oh, I'm Bob from Drop Dead, blah, blah, blah. Don't eat me, blah, blah, blah. All right, I'm Bob from Drop Dead now. Hey, Bob, what's your bad, bro? This is a direct link to the Republican Party. Don't uh, is so bad. The band went on stage and more or less um, insulted the audience. Is that the guy? Same fucking guy! Yeah. The singer was Sieg Heiling and dropping N-bombs and saying some really shitty things. Don't ever do that again. Don't ever do that again. Not anymore. I don't care. I don't fucking care. You're not going to come to Providence and pull that shit. The corner of my eye, I see what I thought was Bob. He had his face was painted. He was painted up like a devil or something that night. He had horns on and everything. He just knocked Seth, like, clear down, clear off the stage. And I knocked Seth off the stage and... Then I got the ball with the drummer. And then just melee just happens, dude. Hey, that's a girl! That's a girl! I ended up getting arrested. My brother put a couple of those guys in the hospital. It turned into an ugly thing, and a, a riot happened, to be honest with you. You go to jail with Seth that night, were you both? Uh, no, he actually pressed charges against me saying that I assaulted him, and, uh, and I, I, guess, I guess I did, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, you're not coming to Providence and Seag Island, man. Uh, it's not even fucking happening. Who said we're a bunch of Nazis? Oh, I said you're yeah. Who complimented this by saying we're a bunch of Nazis? There was a big, big problem with skinheads back in, like, Boston, Providence area, New England area, and anal cunt always attracted the skins. Did you ever attract, like, skinheads at your shows? I think so. They don't know grime. They don't know anything about it. But they love that, you know, all the songs and stuff, you know. Hitler was a sensitive man. There you go. It's a new song. It's called Even Though Your Culture Oppresses Women, You Still Suck, You Fucking Towelhead. <laughs> if we did, I just fucked with them. They'd be like, oh, you know, you know, they, they kind of like, hur, hur, hur. and I'm like, no. I'm making fun of you. So why aren't you going to get, you, I'm making fun of you. One, two, three, four. Towelhead, towelhead. Okay, they're, they're racist, they're this, they're that. I can tell you, I can assure you, Seth was never a racist. I was never a racist. Mike was never a racist. Fred was never a racist. Polly was never a racist. John was never a racist. I know a lot of that stuff was tongue in cheek, you know, but then a lot of that stuff with Seth was really legit. He was definitely a hateful, spiteful, just angry mess of a human being, you know? What was he like? Hilarious. He was a good guy in there. He was cool. They talk about pushing the envelope, man. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. was that all tongue-in-cheek for him, or was he just a... Yeah, he was just like, he would poke. He just wanted to poke everything. Like, he was really fucking mentally deranged. Um, which was hard, man, because I was, like, really close with the guy for years. John liked Seth quite a bit. And Seth really took him to town for it, too. Stealing Seth's Idea is a book written by John Chang. That was one of the song titles on their record. Now, did you know that they were going to write a song about Death Charge? Uh, no. That set put them in the, into their guest list. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of losers. That, that was the other kid. Yeah. This is the guy. <laughs> <laughs> To my knowledge and to what I remember, Seth's favorite bands of all time were Negative Approach and The Village People. He loved The Village People. He saw The Village People uh, more than 30 times. Seth has actually, anal cunts have stayed at my house, you know, with my wife and daughter in it, you know? There are times when he turned off and he'd just be a normal person, not just a, a maniac trying to fuck with people on the street. But that being said, every time we'd go and hang out on Lansdowne Street or something, we'd almost get arrested for him just fucking with people that are trying to eat in the restaurant or something. Did he get arrested often? On stage? No. No. Off stage? I don't, I, no comment on that one. After the shows in Philly, or at least after one of the shows, when we were on the way back to the house, he was like, how's the show, man? I was like, that's pretty good. What'd you think? He's like, I don't remember anything of the shows. I don't, I, I don't think he like remembers the shows that he did, you know? Like, I don't think he could come off stage and be like, oh, that was good or that sucked or whatever. I think when he came off, he had no idea what was going on, you know, blacked out. 
The last time I saw Seth, it was at some club in New York, and Seth's mom was there. And uh, after the show, we were we were all hanging out, and uh, Seth asked me if I'd met his mom before. And I said, yeah, no, I, I, I grabbed her out of the pit. Like, she, she was getting killed by these kids. They were just crashing into her. And she was like this frail woman. She's like five foot nothing. So I grabbed her and pulled her out so she would stop getting clobbered. And, and he freaked out. And he's like, I'm going to fucking kill you. And, like, everybody in the room just sort of stopped because he wasn't joking. And I remember what he did to, to Terry from grief. I mean, he hit the guy in the face intentionally and knocked out half the teeth in his face. Man, even his mom was like, Seth, you know, what are you doing? Calm down. Why are you upset? And he just, like, he, he was insane. I heard later on he went out and got crack and got, like, high that night. Um, like, ended up sleeping on the street someplace. I mean, he was a really fucking disturbed guy. Sometimes the stress of touring, it can do that. Used to be the full-time thing because Misery Index toured, you know, some years we'd do 200 plus shows in a year and that was like the life, you know. I'm glad we don't do that anymore, to be honest. Hurry up and wait, you know, show up, load in, wait around, play, pack up, get going. A huge thing, you know, is like drinking. Bands drink like crazy because you're sitting around all day, there's beer, you know, there's nothing to do. You just slept somewhere and it's the biggest shithole you ever slept at in your life on tour. We do sleep at people's houses and not at hotels because we can't afford hotels. And you wake up in the morning and your whole body from inside out is dirty. It's, it's not what people think it is, you know? They don't think it's this whole fucking drug orgy and that sort of thing, you, you know. It's a job, you know, like any other, but it's just a little different. Whenever someone asks me, Dad, do you guys have other job? My jaw always drops, because how could we not? There's no money to be made. Uh, maybe Nasu makes money. Um, Napalm Death makes money, brutal truth, except that. Like, you're lucky when you pay your, your, your gas and your van payments, you know what I mean? Like, I try to do everything I can, as much as I can, but I'm borrowing money from my friends to print t-shirts. I'm borrowing money from my wife. It's arranged in a circle, so to speak, where it's like I'll press at this plant, and then I'll press the next one here, and then I'll pay this guy and this guy, so you know, it, it's always getting, the person two steps behind is always getting paid, and the record's kind of going around in a circle that way. We started out in a little unit that was probably as big as this little square, and then uh, got a bigger one, and then we moved into this one, and we had to expand into another one over there. And it keeps growing, which is cool, but records is a, it's a messy business, man. Like, that was what DIY was about. It was like, almost was like being a bunch of entrepreneurs and not necessarily catering to what big companies want. Of course, DIY goes a long way. It can be also a lifestyle in, in many other ways. Interviews, fanzines, spread your flyers. Getting the recordings, sending it to get mastered, getting the artwork all together. We cut all the covers and we made it multiple layers with inserts and all stupid stuff. To our money, it's ourselves. We tried to produce everything, coordinate the merchandise, we booked the flights. And back then, you could count on people to actually buy your records. Like, you know, if they were interested, they wanted to support you because it was a DIY thing. They recognized that the kind of content you were making would not exist unless you did it. You don't need uh, big stupid labels uh, who rip you off by big contracts and blah, blah, blah. Try to keep everything in your own hands. Uh, try to work with people uh, you've, cre you've created a network with. It's possible because we are doing it. And then we get our shit released everywhere. I was working as a booking agent doing booking and management at Relapse Records, 
And there was a guy who I was in touch with that organized shows somewhere in Michigan. And he was doing some sort of management for I Hate God, who had lost all of their uh, equipment in the Katrina. It was their, their rehearsal room was flooded out. This guy put together a benefit CD and got in touch with me. He was like, hey, would Brutal Truth want to do something on this, you know? Because we were friends with I Hate God and played tons of shows with them in the past, you know? We got together, quote unquote, just to record that, which I think Gern plays on. Gern came back and, and played, and his chops were just rotten. So it didn't really work out, but we decided we wanted to do it anyways. We tried this other guy, Jody, who'd done some stuff and killed a client and stuff, and he was okay. But uh, Burke was more of a fit. Eric became a full member of Brutal Truth, and then when it was time to write, I had a great writing partner. Because I wrote a lot of the stuff back in the old days, but having Eric in his classic fluid style. The two records I did with him are fucking awesome. I love, I'm very proud of him, and I, and I love him, you know? So it was, uh, it was definitely a good, a good feeling. I, feel fortunate to play for three of my fucking favorite bands, you know? Will you please welcome Mr. Eric Burke? It's not real. I did not for everything, not even. That's, that's fucking cheesy, man. I'm sure a lot of people would call me a dick for that. <laughs> and you know what? So be it. I'm a dick. He was a really good friend of mine. Um, we were like brothers, really. Four of us lived in the same house. There was me, Danny, Jesse and Mitch. Lived in the same house. You know, we went out, drank, partied. And Jesse was, was a very good guitarist. He's a very classical guitarist as well. Jesse was one of the nicest guys ever, you know. Apart from being one of the godfathers of grind. Like anybody, you have perhaps corners of your personality that, you know, you don't show everybody. He never drank really that much when he came to England, and I think, um, you know, when, when you're young, and especially a young American moving to England. I think, but I think towards the end, there was just a lot of stuff going in his head with various things, and he was drinking a little bit more than perhaps he should. I can't, I can't pinpoint to the exact thing that was going on towards the end, but it, it just it got very intense. I just, uh, I think it started to affect his playing a little bit, really, unfortunately. And um, I was really concerned for him. And it was kind of my suggestion, or our suggestion, that he go back home. I spoke to him a few times on the phone and saw him a couple of times. And wasn't quite exactly the Jesse that I remembered, unfortunately. I mean, it's sad because the way me, it ended, well, me and him, I go, Mitchell, if we would have had more time, we probably would have talked things out, and who knows what could have been. But, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, just bad, man. Yeah, I, w I wasn't even allowed to go to the funeral. That's what you get, you fucking asshole. And then he died. Yeah. LOL, I guess. It was kind of a weird thing when he did die because we have some friends that are like, yes, Seth Putnam's dead because he's a total piece of shit. And other people that are like, oh, it's a bummer, you know? So 
I, I would hate to be stoked about anyone's death, you know? I don't think that's a really positive way to approach things. I don't want to, like, shit on his memory, but, like, uh, yeah, he was a fucking scumbag, man. I mean, he was, like, a real backstabbing piece of shit in the end of his life. I don't know what the hell happened to him. Seth was a good guy. I enjoyed partying with him, enjoyed hanging out with him, you know? Fucking tragedy that happened, you know? You know, we were obviously older and he had gone through the coma. We got together and we we uh, did our 20th anniversary show. We did a show in town. It was, you know, and this is one of those moments where I, I never thought I'd ever see you. It's like we played in our hometown to a fucking sold out crowd of just crazy AC fans. I'm like, never did that ever happen in our town. I, I can tell you that the last time I saw him, I'm looking at him, I was looking at his face and I was looking closely at him and I said, you're jaundiced, man. We would go on the road and he would do things he, you know, a person in, in, a, in a healthy body could, shouldn't do. And he was doing stuff in a body that had been really fucked. And, you know, he would be like, I'm gonna go do this. I'm like, hey, look, man, you're an adult. You can do what you want. I can kick and scream all I want and I can't do that anymore. When, when uh, his wife called me, I was not surprised. I was disappointed. People see that set that, you know, rolled around on stage and did a lot of drugs. I know a guy that he and I would sit and watch movies all day or watch The Simpsons and fucking eat Chinese food and talk about goofy stuff or play music or, you know, that was, you know, it's my friend, you know? And that's what I miss, you know? I miss that guy, you know? And it just sucks. Grindcore is kind of, I don't think it's just aping what the original bands did. It's not really that fresh, is it? I mean, the future of Grindcore really is, I would say some electronic element. I don't actually know for sure that <laughs> someone's got to surprise me. But if it's not, uh, if it doesn't include that, it wouldn't be very contemporary music, I don't think. You know, for a while it was a studio band. We played three songs at a New England metal hardcore festival in 2003, something like that. We had a few plans to do it. I should say discussions. Back to our you good? Mike! Back to our yeah. Is this your stage get up? Two, one, two, two, Pig Destroyer was the side project. Agoraphobic was the main thing, because we'd already had honky reduction out on relapse, and there'd already been kind of like a ground swell for Agoraphobic at that point. And was there ever a thought of having a drummer for Agoraphobic, or was that always the...? Yeah, I mean, we always kind of didn't really want a drummer, but we did entertain having a drummer, and we actually, I practiced with Dave Whitty a couple times in the uh, early 90s. Um, but I think Jay and I just wanted to keep it very simple and didn't want to overcomplicate Agoraphobic with playing live. Strangely enough, we're gonna need some uh, drums, like snare and kick up there. Snare, kick, uh, vocals, and probably guitar and bass. We need a little bit of time for the changeover. What could go wrong tomorrow night? Oh, there's lots that could go wrong. Somebody could spill beer on the computer. We could have some equipment problems. Unplug a cable, there's a million cables plugged in. There could be a fire. The cops can come and shut the show down. Somebody could have a heart attack. I don't know. I, that's why I, I just want to get through this one gig and see what the, what the unforeseen things are that can happen. Hopefully nothing. Hopefully nothing. Get 
I wanted straightforward, everything fucking red, bleeding through everything, noise, just go. You know, code red. Hit it. What's a rind? Crust on the outside. Oh, it's the, kind of like the, the it's like a pumpkin. It's no, it's Wait, like, you were saying watermelon? It's like stucco. It feels like it's oh, uh, all like a cantaloupe. Like a cantaloupe or a, even a coconut. Yeah, Wait, coconut. coconut. Has a rind. Cheese has a rind. Well, good cheese. What the fuck is a pork cheese. rind?